So in this video, I would like to look at uh, polytropic processes for ideal gases. So we had, in the end of the last video, looked at a reversible process that was adiabatic with constant C sub P and C sub V, so delta S is 0. And we had said that you could go through and use these definitions of constant C sub P and C sub V in terms of K, the ratio of CP to CV, and R, the gas constant, which is the difference between CP and CV. And if we did that and substituted in, integrated and rearranged, we came up with this, which was our polytropic process. So we've got a polytropic process with polytropic index K, C sub P over C sub V for an ideal gas. And if we combine that with the ideal gas law to introduce temperature into this, I end up with this expression here, which is a very useful way of approximating isentropic processes when the temperatures are low and Cp over C sub V is very close to constant, or when I'm talking about systems where I don't really care about getting a highly precise answer. Okay, And so I want to just have something I can do algebraically and look at that. So let's do that example we had before, that we have air at 660 kilopascals and 1100 Kelvin, expanding reversibly and adiabatically to 1100 or no to 110 kilopascals, and we want to know the final temperature. So I can just use the ratios from that equation, and so the temperature initially times the pressure ratio to the k minus 1 over k power. k is 1.4, so k minus 1 is 0 0.4 over 1.4. Be sure on your calculator you do this first. Raise this number to that power. You're going to get 659 kelvins. Now, if you don't recall, before when we did this, we got 693. So it's not as good, okay? You're not going to get as accurate an answer, but it's quick, okay? And if I'm just wanting to know approximate answers, ballpark, what am I going to get for a temperature? It's a great little tool to have. So what about just polytropic processes in general? So we did this in Chapter 3. In fact, this is a slide out of that chapter. But we're just adding new terminology. So what I had said before is that the work for a polytropic process is PV minus PV over 1 minus N. Or if it's an ideal gas, it's R times T2 minus T1, only for an ideal gas. But if right now I'm only considering ideal gases, this is great. This, of course, is not going to satisfy if N is equal to 1. Then I have division by 0. Always a problem. In those cases, I could do um, just the integration, okay? It's going to be actually be an easy integration. I get PdV over V, and so I end up with this expression here. This would be true, the polytropic processes now that we know, if it's isentropic in an ideal gas, that polytropic index is K. If it's isothermal in an ideal gas, the polytropic index is 1, which would be this case. If it's isobaric, n is equal to 1, or excuse me, 0, so constant pressure, n is equal to 0. And if it's isochoric, n equals infinity, meaning I'm dividing by infinity, meaning the work is 0. So I now have sort of a way to summarize and name some polytropic processes that are going to just naturally occur as long as I assume reversible and ideal gas. So let's look at an example here. If we want to find the specific work you required for a compressing steam isothermally from 14.7 psi, 600 degrees Fahrenheit, to 200 psi, and we're going to assume it's reversible in a closed process, then what I would end up doing is, first of all, establish if this is an ideal gas. Okay, and at these temperatures and pressures, in fact, Z is about 1. Okay, so I look this up on the compressibility chart. This is the critical temperature and critical pressure, finding the reduced temperature and pressure, 
looked it up on the compressibility chart, it's an ideal gas. So if it's an ideal gas and it's isothermal, then work is RT log of the ratio of the pressures. And so I'm able to calculate that and get a good rough answer. Okay, 237,000 foot-pounds force per pound mass of work would be required to do this compression. It's negative because, of course, it's work input. So we're going to stop the video here, and we're going to come back and look at how would I calculate entropy changes for irreversible processes.